بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Today's surah is surah al-takathur and regarding the type of surah there is a difference of opinion a minor difference of opinion amongst the scholars the massive majority of the scholars are of the opinion that it is a Meccan surah there are like three scholars who consider it to be Medinan. As a matter of fact, the, the uh, scholars who rule it to be Meccan are so many to the extent that some of the, the, the scholars like Ibn Atiyah from the 6th century and Al-Shawkani and Al-Tahir ibn Ashur and others uh, stated this to be a consensus amongst the scholars that it's a Meccan surah and that there is no difference of opinion. <clears throat> However, we will say there is a difference of opinion even if it's a minor difference. The name of the surah is Surah Al-Takathur according to the majority of the books of Tafsir. It was revealed uh, after Surah Al-Kawthar and before Surah uh, Al-Ma'un. And regarding the reason for the revelation of the surah, there are different uh, narrations uh, stating different reasons behind the revelation. However, None of these uh, narrations, none of these stories have uh, authentic uh, chain of narrations or narrators. So they're not sound and therefore cannot be relied on. Some said that it was uh, a dispute amongst the Jews that our tribes are better than your tribes amongst themselves. And uh, another story said that it's, you know, it was amongst two tribes of the uh, Quraysh Saham and uh, Banu Abdul Manaf, who uh, started boasting about their numbers, and we have more honorable people, more of the elite are from us. But none of these uh, are authentic uh, narrations and therefore cannot be relied on. <coughs> Getting to the surah, Allah Azza wa says, Al Hakum al Takathur, Hatta Zurtum al Maqabir. Al Hakum al Takathur is a form of reproach from Allah. Al-Hakum al-Takathur means competition in worldly increase diverts you. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal did not mention what type of increase he's talking about, that he is reproaching, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's as per the scholars for two reasons. Number one is that any type of competition towards increase in worldly matters regardless of the type any any time it will busy you from your goal your objective your reason of existence which is to worship Allah alone then it is something reproach regardless of what it is that you're increasing in all right uh, the other reason is that so it remains a general statement that will encompass anything people can increase in for the purpose of show off like lineage, offspring, wealth, as well as encompassing anything that can busy the person, he or she, from the path of Allah Azza wa Jal and the purpose of creation, whether it is a business, whether it is a job, and so on and so forth. Now, the, the type of, now, you must know that not every <clears throat> increase in worldly matters is something that's dispraised. As Ibn al-Qayyim said, it is only dispraised when it is busy in you, new, it's preoccupying you from Allah Azza wa Jal, from worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. And when it is the second type or reason for it becoming dispraised, when it is not intended for the sake of Allah to make you draw closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. Otherwise, Us Uthman radiallahu anhu is one of the richest. Talha ibn Ubaidillah. When he died, he had massive lands as real estate. He was an owner of a lot of lands in Medina. 
In one time, his wife Su'da bint Auf said one time he went out and spent 700,000. So he, they had money, but it did not preoccupy them from Allah Azza And they obtained it not for the sake of it in itself, but rather for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal and to help the needy and all that. Abdullah ibn Shakhir, and this is reported by Imam Muslim, he radiallahu anhu said, I came to the Prophet وسلم, while he was reciting Al Hakum Takathur. And after he finished, وسلم, he said, The son of Adam will say, My wealth, my wealth, he's showing off. And then the Prophet وسلم, set things in order. He said, But the son of Adam will only have of his wealth that he spends is that which he gives out as charity. And he has sent forth, it's saved for him. And that's that which he used to get food with and he consumed. And that which he used to buy clothes with and he wears it out. In other words, whatever you collect, whatever increase you make in worldly matters, if it is from the first time for the sake of Allah, for the purpose of drawing nearer to Allah Azza wa then rest assured you'll be rewarded for it, for, for it and it's waiting for you there. Anything else, if it's halal, then the best is that you're not going to be punished for it. If you used it also in halal means. So if it's earned halal, spent in halal. To summarize this, this uh, verse, it is only when you're diverted from your objective, fulfilling servitude to Allah Azza wa Jal, only then working for this dunya is something that is dispraised. Hatta zurtumul maqabr until you visit the graveyards. Until you die. Shaykh Al-Uthaymeen said, you continue like this until you die. This is what Allah is reproaching. This is what Allah is rebucking. To continue concerned and worried and busy and preoccupied until you die. Until you're thrown into that two by six feet hole in the ground. Subhanallah, this, the nature of mankind is that their urge and keenness to collect more never ends. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Muslim, he said, the son of Adam grows older and two qualities grow with him. They increase as he grows older. His love to collect more of this life. You give him one, he wants two. You give him two, he wants four. You give him four, he wants eight, and so on. He's never, he is, the son of Adam is never satisfied. They always want more. This is our nature. We always want more. And the second quality is that, hoping to live long. He hates death. Why? One of the scholars said, why is it that we hate death? He said, because you've uh, decorated and constructed your dunya and ruined your akhirah. So you hate to leave what's decorated and adorned and move into a place that's a ruin. So this is, this, this is the nature of the son of Adam, except those whom Allah Azza wa Jal uh, blesses. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim said something about this verse. It's very beautiful. Very deep insight. He said, Allah said, until you visit the graveyard. He said, this is to tell you that 
you're going to be in that grave for a short period. Now short is relatively speaking, compared to eternally everything is short. Uthman radiallahu anhu, the Prophet sallallahu died more than 1400 years ago, right? Or 1400 years ago. That's short. Why? Because etern something that's eternal, infinity, anything next to that is negligible, insignificant as a number. He said, and this is also to remind people that your stay in this life is a visit. So you're visiting in this life and then you'll be visiting in that grave until you're resurrected and then that's the real life. As Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَإِنَّ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ And indeed the hereafter is the real life. Now, these two verses are a warning from Allah. It's like Allah Azza wa Jal is sending us someone to or sending someone to warn a group, a group of people, and he's shouting aloud. They're, walk, they're walking toward a cliff, after which is a deep, deep distance, and they're going blindfolded, heedless, indifferent, going into that direction, and he's shouting at them, wait, be careful, you're about to die. Wake up, go back to Allah, fulfill the objective, be a slave, work for the Akhirah, unfold your eyes to the reality of this life. No, you are going to know, then no, you are going to know. Kalla is used to have or to, to convey two meanings. It means indeed you will know. And it is a form of rebucking the person addressed with it. But notice that in these two verses, Allah Azza wa Jal did not disclose what it is that we are going to know. What is that knowledge that He's talking about? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is threatening is rebucking but not disclosing what it is. Now Shaykh al Uthaymeen, of course is elaborating to explain Allah Azza wa Jal is telling them that you're going to know your destiny once you reach the hereafter. After the short visit in this life and in the grave you're going to definitely know the outcome of what you did. And that the only thing that will benefit you is the good deeds that you perform. As the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim, he said the son of Adam will go to his, graves, to his grave with three things. His wealth, family and deeds. Two will go back and one remains with him. His deeds remain and his wealth and family go back. Life goes on. The one who loves you the most, father, mother, wife, whatever, children, they will cry and weep. But eventually, life will continue. And you will become a memory. And they will say, oh, may Allah, if they're righteous people, they say, may Allah have mercy and forgive our father or my husband or my wife or my son. But then life will continue. They will remember you occasionally. And the only thing that will really and truly and eternally benefit you and me are deeds, our actions. The second verse is a confirmation. And again, nothing disclosed to deepen that effect, to make you scared more. What is it that Allah is talking about? No, if you only knew the knowledge of certainty. Again, knowledge of certainty about what?
لَتَرَوْنَ الْجَحِيمِ This is the knowledge. You will surely see the hellfire. You will see the consequence of being preoccupied with dunya. When you see the fire of hell. In, in Surah Al-Qari'ah, Allah Azza wa Jal, if you remember, Allah spoke about the consequence of the people who did good and the consequence of the people who did evil. And then he spoke about Hawiyah, the, the name of fire. Well, Allah Azza wa Jal, Al-Jaheem here, the hell fire is Al-Hawiyah mentioned there. Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioning one of the reasons one becomes deserving of going upside down, as we said, Ummuhu Hawiyah, he goes downwards with his head down and his feet up into the pitch of fire, the bottomless, right? Is when he diverts, he loses, loses, loses focus, he's off track. When one becomes thus, this way, then he subjects himself of being deserving of Hawiyah and Jaheem. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوْنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ Then you will surely, surely see it with the eye of certainty, meaning with actual eyesight. You will surely, Allah Azza wa Jal confirms again, that you will surely see that fire. You will see the consequence of your negligence. You will see the result of you diverting from the path of Allah. Now certainty is mentioned twice in here. In this verse, Allah says the eye of certainty and the verse before, two verses before, Allah says, with knowledge of certainty. And there is another verse Allah says, Haqqul Yaqeen, which is the true certainty. So these are three types of certainty. The first one is the knowledge of certainty. This is something that one obtains by being informed of something. Like Allah informing us in the Quran and the Sunnah about Jannah, about Jahannam and all that. That's the knowledge of certainty. We, we come to know from confirmed sources of information. The second is Aynul Yaqeen, the eye of certainty is something that is uh, realized by actual eyesight, the tangible eyesight seeing something, like seeing the fire uh, on the hereafter. Haqqul Yaqeen is something that is, that results from tangible senses like Taste, for example, touch, touching and tasting are haqqul yaqeen. As Allah Azza wa Jal uh, said about those uh, deniers of the truth of the message of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, min hamim Then for them is accommodation in boiling water and burning in hellfire, indeed this is the true certainty. So this is the third type of certainty. Allah concludes the, the surah with a, a, a shocking verse to people whose main concern is dunya, who uh, were preoccupied, al the end connects with the beginning, uh, he said, warning people, waking in us up. Then you will surely be asked on that day about pleasures. The pleasures, any pleasure you enjoyed in this dunya, prepare an answer for because you and I will be asked uh, about it. You'll be asked, did you obtain it from halal or haram? And did you spend it in halal or haram? Was it something that Allah allowed you to get? 
And then did you spend it in a way Allah permitted you to or not? Subhanallah, this, uh, the theme of this surah is reflecting how fast this life is. It's like a snap. Visit, come out, then see with your own eye, being questioned about everything. It's like, you know that old video filming, that uh, round, you know, it, it's like that. You'll be asked about everything that just passed just like this, so fast, so quick. You didn't have a chance to take a, a breath and to get through. You can't. It's too fast. We feel it's so slow. But in actuality, it's so fast. How old are you? How old am I? How long did it take for this time to pass? You think it took 50, 60, 70, 40, 30 years to pass? It doesn't feel this way. It feels like yesterday. When I look at my son, who's 31 years old, I remember when he used to hang in my beard with his both, both of his hands when he was months old. I can't, I can't believe time passed so quickly. But it will, and it did. And what's remaining is so short. Abu Huraira, and this is reported by Tirmidhi and classified as authentic by Albani, he said, when this verse uh, was revealed, people asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what pleasure is meant by this ayah? What is the pleasure that we're going to be questioned about? And all we have uh, to consume in our life is water and dates. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Indeed, this is from the pleasures of Allah and you will be held accountable for it. Water? Dates? In another narration, he said, don't you wear sandals? This is Naeem. Don't you have a shade covering your head? That's Naeem. Allahu Akbar, if that's going to be asked about, what about this? What about air conditioning? What about cars? What about three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten bedroom apartments or, or rather villas and houses? What answers do people have? Someone has dates to eat and we have supplies for a year ahead. Their concern was about a date and we're indifferent about a full year's supply. We don't even think about it as something to be worried about. To conclude the uh, uh, story that's, subhanAllah, has so many uh, lessons to be learned from it and uh, it's so deep and so touching. It's reported by Muslim that one day the Prophet Sallallahu left his house in the middle of the day after Dhuhr. During a time where people usually stay home because it's too hot. And especially in Medina, summer is extremely hot. So he walked out and he came across Abu Bakr sitting on the side. He said, Abu Bakr, what makes you come out during this time of the day? <laughs> when no one comes out, it's too hot. He said, I swear by Allah who has sent you with the truth, the only thing that drove me out of my house is hunger. Abu Bakr doesn't have food. Who spent all his money for the sake of Allah, freeing slaves, supporting the Prophet ﷺ. As the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is in Bukhari, he said, مَا نَفَعَنِي اللَّهُ بِمَالِ مَا نَفَعَنِي بِمَالِ أَبِي بَكْرِ Allah did not benefit me from the wealth of anyone as much as he benefited me from the wealth of Abu Bakr. He cried and he said, Fidaka Abi wa ummi ya Rasulullah wa hal ana wa mali illa fidallah wa rasulullah. He said, May my father and mother be ran ransom for your sake. Me and my wealth are for no other purpose but Allah and His Messenger. This man is driven out of his house because he had no food. So he took him and he st they started walking and they came across Umar. 
And he asked him the same as he asked Abu Bakr. And he answered exactly the same thing. The Prophet said, وَالَّذِي بَعَثَنِي بِالْحَقِّ مَا أَخْرَجَنِي إِلَّا الْجُوعِ By him who has sent me with the truth, nothing drove me out of my house except hunger. Muhammad The dearest of the creation to Allah, the most beloved to Allah, the final messenger is driven out of his house because of hunger. And when many days we feel sick because of overeating, not because we're hungry. So he took them and they went to the house of one of the Ansar. His name is Malik ibn Tayyihan al Awsi, Abu al Haytham. The Prophet ﷺ knocked at the door and the wife responded. He said, where is Abu al-Haytham? She said, he went out to uh, fetch water for us. Come on in. You are the best guests anyone can get. So she prepared the place for them and she allowed them in and she left. Shortly after, Abu al-Haytham walks in and he said, Allahu Akbar, how honored am I no one has more honorable guests today than myself and he went and cut a branch from the palm tree the Prophet ﷺ said you could have just picked some and selected some and he said no I wanted to bring the all the entire branch and put it in front of you and make you choose whatever you desire from it and then he grabbed a knife and went to slaughter an animal. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Iyaka wal halub." Beware! Don't slaughter an animal that has milk because it's breastfeeding its babies. So he slaughtered. His wife cooked, and they ate. And then the Prophet ﷺ looked at Abu Bakr and Umar, and he said, "Hunger drove you out of your homes." And you did not go back home until you ate from this ni'mah. You will be questioned on the day of judgment about this. What more can someone say about this verse after the story? Not much. Except that as I always say, the chance is still there because we're still alive. So let's take advantage of our final breaths because we don't know when the final breath will be. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to enable us to be focused on our objective and not to be diverted. Allahumma ameen, subhanakallahumma bihamdik, ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.